I'm Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation, and it is Wednesday, July 31st, 2013, and I'm with Ellen Bradbury Reed. And my first question for Ellen is to please tell us your name and spell it. Ellen Bradbury Reed. Uh, actually, I was Ellen Wilder. Then I married John Bradbury and then eventually married Ed Reed. So it's uh, E-L-L-E-N-B-R-A-D-B-U-R-Y-R-E-I-D. Ellen, uh, I want to know about um, your very beginnings. Can you tell us um, in what year you were born and some of the circumstances uh, you know, about your, your very earliest years? Um, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, 1939 and my father is a chemical was a chemical engineer and I think he worked I don't know that he ever worked I guess it was a chemist anyway he worked in a brewery Ertl's brewery which made of what we'd now call a micro brew on a local distributor and he said that was what he did for the war effort was he was making beer it was very important to the war he thought and uh, he was eventually drafted into the Navy, I think in 43 or 44. Initially, he failed the draft. He had some problem with his lungs. But when he was drafted, he was uh, eventually sent to Oak Ridge because he had skills that they were looking for. And he was at a Oak Ridge a short period of time. And then Norris Bradbury was looking for people who knew I guess chemistry or high explosives, and he interviewed Daddy, and so Norris eventually selected seven guys from, I think, all over the country, they were all in the military, to come to Los Alamos to work on the implosion detonator. It was when they couldn't make the uh, plutonium they were getting from Hanford to detonate. The plutonium that they had been getting from Lawrence was very, very pure, but the plutonium coming out of Hanford pre-detonated or fizzled. And so they recruited these seven guys. And uh, so Daddy went out to Los Alamos and eventually we followed with some thought that we would have a house. But when we got to, well, you, you know, you went to 109 East Palace. Anyway, there wasn't any housing. And so for a little while, we stayed in a motel in Albuquerque, which was, they wouldn't let any more people stay in Santa Fe. Santa Fe had more than its quota of strange people who were, you know, Los Alamos couldn't accommodate them, so they were living in Santa Fe, and they didn't want any more people doing that. So we went to Albuquerque, and that was very far away. And eventually, uh, Daddy and another family, the Wilsons, bought sheep herders tents, and we moved into a tent in Bandelier in the bottom of Frijoles Canyon. Now, the year previously, I think in 44, before the plutonium crisis, they had housed some of the people at Los Alamos in Bandelier, where there was a little guest ranch, and Mrs. Fry ran it. I think, and I'm not sure this is true, that because of the proximity to S site, where they were working with conventional explosives, they moved everybody out of those houses. So there were, they, they wouldn't let us move in the houses, but we put up two great big tents and we lived in a tent. And it was great for daddy, he thought, because he could drive up the back way and go in the back gate to S site. You'll have some map to show where S site is. So anyway, so it was summer and it seemed, to a kid, it seemed just great. <laughs> so, well, my father and mother, both on different sides of the family, came from from Kentucky, and they had houses that were like plantations, big houses, and uh, they had lived not in great luxury, but to go from living in a big house with some maids and a lot of family around to living in a tent. Uh, my mother is a chemist, too. And although she didn't work at the lab. Uh, and so it was, I think for my mother in particular, perhaps quite a shock to go live in a tent with two kids. 
under the age of six. And, you know, there was, we just got water out of a little tap and we cooked on the campfire and the squirrels stole all the food. And at night the skunks came in the tent. We thought it was very exciting. And <laughs> the other family, the Wilsons, we camped close together. And uh, I'm not really sure that they left one car for the women, but the men took one car up to work every day. And, you know, we were close, so we could hear the explosions. They tested all the time at Los Alamos, you know, and they did after the war, too. Uh, so we were used to big explosions. Uh, and, I mean, from a kid point of view, we could climb in the ruins. I can't believe they let us do this, but we walked up to the ceremonial cave, if anyone has ever been there. And I pushed my brother in a kiva once and went home. And he said, well, where's your brother? I don't know, you know, what, I don't know where he is. Anyway, he was in a kiva crying. And uh, there was one ranger, that poor ranger, had to go get him out of the kiva. Where I still didn't know how he had gotten there. But uh, we had, for, our, uh, for a little kid, it was amazing to live down there. For my mother, as she said, well, we did what we could to help the war effort. So, so how old was um, your brother? In he the was time? three when I pushed him in the kiva. Yeah, yeah. I think the kiva was filled up with dirt. I mean, I didn't push him in. It's not as deep as it is now, so didn't seem to be hurt at all. <laughs> it's good. But he yeah. couldn't get out. There was no, no ladder. Oh, no, no, no. He couldn't get out. I thought that was the good part. He couldn't get out. So. I thought I remember another story. You pushed him in a culvert. That was later, yes. Yeah, I know. You, <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> but that was, uh, I can go on and yeah, tell that sure. because, well, that summer, at some point, there were a lot of fish in the creek, and I think it was because the canyon had been closed a long time. And so we would just wade around and pick up fish behind their gills. And, we couldn't see why anybody would use a pole when you could just wade around and pick up a fish. But, and sometimes we threw rocks at the fish. They weren't in much danger, but my brother hit my thumb instead of a fish and broke my thumb. And I guess it was a Saturday because Daddy was home and he wanted to take me up to the hospital at Los Alamos. And we got to the back gate and the MP wouldn't let me in because I didn't have a pass. And I remember my father really got pretty mad at this MP who was probably 18 and had his orders. And I was sitting there sobbing with my little bleeding thumb. And, and the MP was finally, he just said, just go on, you know. And I said to my father, well, well, why couldn't I go? He said, well, we're doing something very important and it's very secret and, and we have to protect the secret. And I thought, hmm. I will find out what this secret is and I will tell. So we got to the hospital and I looked all around and boy, it didn't look like anything very interesting to me compared to Bandelier, which had rabbits and squirrels and deer and skunks. And here was this, this military buildings and a lot of fences. But on the pond in the center, there were ducks. And I thought, well, that has to be it. We didn't have any ducks in Bandelier. So I counted, there were 11 ducks. That was about the extent of my, you know, numerical abilities of the 11 ducks. I thought, that has to be it. So, <clears throat> you know, I fixed my thumb, we go home. The war ended and we got a house at Los Alamos in the McKee area. And it was right near the fence. And I thought, oh, this is good. Because then I can sit by the fence and the, whoever, I was a little unclear who, the spy, I thought I was a spy, two will come by and I will say 11 ducks. Then I can get even with these people. Well, no one ever came. I mean, the MPs came and they would say, what are you doing, little girl? And I was just nothing. I'm sitting by the fence waiting. And, you know, they had Jeep patrols a lot and they had sometimes horses. And, but no one ever asked me except what I was doing, which of course I couldn't tell them. And finally I got tired of it, or got tired of sitting there, and I got my brother, who was smaller, and I wanted him to go under the fence where there was a culvert and find whoever it was, and they'd bring them to me. I would say 11 ducks. And then I could get my security clearance because 
I did want to live with my parents, and I knew you needed a clearance if you lived with, you know, you had to have a clearance to get in Los Alamos. So anyway, I pushed him into this culvert, and he got his knees and elbows pushed up underneath him, because I pushed him. And he couldn't move, and he started to cry. And I thought, this isn't good. And the MP came by, and he said, well, what's the matter? And, you know, he's stuck in the culvert. <laughs> it's like, I was sure he was going to tell on me. And then pretty soon my mother came. They couldn't get him out of the culvert. Finally, my father, they got my father from Essex to get him out. And so he just pulled his legs, and then he came out, and I thought, this is it. He's going to tell on me. I know how he got in that, but he, he was so upset he didn't tell. I thought, well, I guess I'll change careers. I thought I would be a trapeze artist. That would be a better, a safer career, I thought, than being a spy, because spying wasn't working out for me. But then I got my pass at six at Los Alamos. You got a security clearance. And I was fingerprinted and mugshot, and I had a pass. I thought it was extremely cool. And I had abandoned espionage as a career. So that's wonderful. So to, what has become of Marshall? <laughs> well, he survived all of that. <laughs> yeah. but, That's great. He yeah. has not pursued espionage as No, a no, neither one of us, no, no. But there still are ducks, and uh, the ducks turned out to be, you know, I think, well, another story about the ducks. I am not sure this is true, but I've read that as Los Alamos was being put together, they, you know, they would just ship things. And at some point, they hired a guy who had come from someplace in Texas where he ran some sort of a facility for shell-shocked soldiers. And he wanted it to be very tranquil, and it had a lake, and he had ordered some ducks, which he thought added to the tranquility. So when he got to Los Alamos, he looked around, he thought, it's another facility for shell-shocked soldiers or what. They didn't tell him what. So he ordered ducks. And I don't know if that really is the origin of the ducks, but there have always been ducks there. So even now, when it's being redone, there's a duck rescue going on. So we're taking care of the ducks. I may have told you this, that because we were living in the car, well, well the car was the only place that had a radio. After, it must have been the Hiroshima drop, the radio station KRS, and I know other people have talked to you about this radio station where they sometimes tell or play the piano or Oppenheimer loaned them records. And anyway, they, we got in the car because they played this, was a wire, not a tape, of the cockpit recording. It must have been the Enola Gay. Um, and so what we heard, and Daddy said, you should listen to this. You, this is really very important. This is what we've been doing. And so you heard the plane motors, and then they counted down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And they said bombs away, and then there was the, you know, the plane dips and pulls away to avoid the shock. Well, what I thought was most interesting was they could count backwards. I thought, explosions, we'd heard those, but the counting backwards, that was very cool. And, and that piece of tape may be still batting around Los Alamos somewhere, and it's something that would be important for all of us to get a hold of, if we could. And KRS, which then became KRSN, uh, was, it must have had some small frequency, so it didn't go very far. And, you know, in retrospect, it's pretty funny in a place that was so obsessed with secrecy, certainly you could hear the radio station outside the fence because we were living way outside the fence. Uh, but it was a station, the, you know, it's something that maybe you've had other people talk about, but the atmosphere at Los Alamos was people were really very interested in music and they had amateur theatricals, particularly when the British got to Los Alamos. The Brits, of course, loved to do crazy little skits, and they did Gilbert and Sullivan, and so there was an interest in music and in theater and in culture in general. And this station was, maybe you would have 
in part called it like a classical music station now. People loaned them records and they played records and as I said Teller would sometimes play the piano for them and uh, the announcer Bob Borton was there for a long long time but it was a community radio station uh, that is still on the air I think was important to us in the early well and even in the 2000 fire I think that station you know they needed before the internet some way of getting everybody to say okay the fire is too close and we're going to evacuate and keep track of people and things so it's been an important part of the community for a long time did um, do you remember any story hour uh, that the radio program might have had I don't know. Okay. I think I'd heard that uh, some of the signs is like Teller would read stories of the big bad wolf or something. Oh. <laughs> <He> <laughs> I don't know. I know. Yeah. That sort of stuck in my mind. Yeah. Oh, well, that'd be good. Anyway, I don't, I don't remember. Um, let's see. So at this point, at the end of the war, you're still just six years old. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So when did you start going to school? Well, I went. I was in the first class and went all the way through school at Los Alamos. So I started in first grade and there were, I'm sure there are people who have said, many children born at Los Alamos. The, it was the pre-baby boom, baby boom. It was, I think it cost a dollar to have a baby and so everybody did. And there's that story at one point Grove says to Oppenheimer, you have to get a handle on this, you know, there are too many babies born. And, Oppenheimer's wife was pregnant at the time and he said he didn't think that that was included in his responsibilities to stop that. But so when I started there were so many kids that we had two first grades uh, and my teacher was Mrs. Tinsley who I just loved but I was so, and I had taught myself to read <clears throat> and I thought I would get in trouble if they knew that I could read but I was so shy I wouldn't talk and um, she figured out that I could read, though. <laughs> uh, it was a class that, by, I don't think it was an experiment, but by and large, that class stayed together until we graduated. So we went all the way through school together as this first grade class that was of the two first grades. Mrs. Hillhouse was the other teacher. And we went to Central School and uh, it was, I think we had very good teachers really all the way through. And by the time I was in third grade, the, when the war ended, of course, a lot of the scientists left. And then some came back, which is a whole other topic we could talk about. But one of the things Norris Bradbury realized he had to do was have better housing and better schools and so they built the western area and some houses that are around uh, where Kenyon School. So there were then two elementary schools, Mesa School and Kenyon School. And uh, so the third grade, by the third grade, uh, we'd moved to the western area to a real house that had not a prefab house. And have people talked about bathtub row a little for you? Uh, that would be good bit. for you to... Uh, but anyway, yeah, bathtub row consisted of the houses that were there from the boys' school, and they were log cabins, and they were not all designed as houses. Some were like school facilities, but they all became houses, and they had bathtubs. And when Grove started, you know, moving housing up the hill, that was all prefab, and there were no bathtubs. There were showers everywhere. So they started calling this row of houses bathtub row. Now also bathtub row had big trees and lilacs and apricot trees. I mean it was lush by comparison because nothing else, no grass, no, it was just muddy when it rained. There was, you know, that would be a luxury. And, and the thinking was of course that the town would just disappear after the war so why would you do anything but of course, it didn't disappear. We plunged immediately into the Cold War and the hydrogen bomb and the whole build-up to that. Uh, they needed to keep the scientists there, so they 
Norris Bradbury had them build better houses. And the western area houses had bathtubs and they had yards with grass and we had something called Zia Company. And Zia Company would come and fix anything. The, so the men didn't have to fix things, you know, that would distract them from their work. So Zia Company would come fix your fence or just do anything, anything that broke the hot water heater or something, Zia would come and fix it. It was just great growing up with Zia Company. And they mowed the grass, not in your yard, but all the, I guess what we'd now call common areas. Uh, Zia Company maintained them. And uh, they were, they worked for both inside and outside the fence. At that point, uh, I think you might have had to be 12 to have a pass. The, the age kept going up. It was six and it was eight. I mean, so 12 maybe. And I mean, there was still a fence. But it was an easy fence to get around. I mean, the first fence you could wiggle underneath it or push your brother through a culvert, whichever. But the now, you know, when we lived in the western area, which was probably late 40s, early 50s, the, the fence was you could easily jump over the fence, and we did all the time. And we just played in the canyons, and and it was really a wonderful place to grow up because it was totally safe. We didn't have crime. Uh, I, we did have police, I think, but you still had security everywhere. But you didn't to live in the residential area. I guess we still had passes. At one point, I lost my pass, and I, I still have this pass. I must have been 12. And it was really very bad. If you lost your pass, that was very serious. But you couldn't leave without your pass, so you couldn't hide it. You had to confess. And it was one of the things you were not, you know, if your mother let you carry your own pass, don't lose it. Well, I did. Anyway, so I got another pass. And then I found the pass that I had lost, and I was way too scared to tell them that I had found the pass. So I still have it. <laughs> it just, it was just like, oh my God. I just didn't want to tell anybody I had found the pass that after I'd gotten a second pass. So, but it's interesting in a funny way. It didn't seem restrictive to me, but I think I had no other point of reference. I was, we were all thrilled to get a pass my friend Paula Schreiber was, oh, she was just, wanted to get a pass. She was always a little too young. And she, she thought it was so cool if you would have a pass. She finally got a pass, but I mean, you know, instead of thinking that you were in some sort of concentration camp, because we did live inside a fence. Well, we could get out of the fence. There wasn't any place to go. Um, and it, it never struck me as oppressive, I guess. I was sort of, the you know, you could ride your bike anywhere. If you got in trouble, somebody knew you and picked you up and sent you home. Or I like to climb things. I climbed a cliff once and got stuck. And the fire chief had to come get me down off the cliff. I thought that was embarrassing. but. It was nice that, you know, they had so little to do. They could pick kids, kittens out of trees, bears off of telephone poles, kids who'd climb cliffs. I mean, it had, in a way, that 50s kind of, despite the work, this very tranquil feeling about the town itself, to me. Lots of clubs, women's clubs, lots of churches, um, Still not much going back and forth to Santa Fe. It was a little far, and I think within Santa Fe, they thought people at Los Alamos were a little weird. And actually, to go on with that, by the time we were in high school, there was more rivalry because how would you like the kids from Los Alamos? They have better football equipment. They have prettier cheerleaders. They have a better debating team. You know, anywhere you went, there was Los Alamos. Here's poor New Mexico struggling along, and then the kids from Los Alamos pop up and win everything and then go home again behind the fence. It's, you could see how it wasn't. So the fights after the football or basketball games were always much more exciting than the games. Try to get the team from the 
court back on the bus without having a fight. That was, yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, being on the inside, you don't have much vantage of the larger world. I mean, it always seemed, um, I was interested in things and I can remember the Oppenheimer trial when Oppenheimer lost his clearance. I didn't really understand what he had done, and indeed, we don't understand that very well now. He hadn't done anything. Uh, but I could see that people were really upset about that. I mean, it was sort of the first time I thought what, you know, we thought Edward Teller was more or less like the devil. He was, it, there was a universal. Yeah. And Time Magazine had a picture of Edward Teller on the magazine cover for some reason. And everybody get Los Alamos canceled their subscription. The library, everyone, phew, was gone. We can't have that. So, can you explain for people who may not be so what, familiar, just give them a... a, a, a well, when Oppenheimer was really being prosecuted uh, by a guy named Louis Strauss, who was um, perhaps jealous of Oppenheimer's facility, and Oppenheimer had uh, shown that facility in a way that made Strauss look silly. Uh, they put up what was really a witch hunt to get Oppenheimer and the result was he lost his clearance so he couldn't go behind the fence, he couldn't go into the lab areas and he would have the clearance had anyone with any sense been able to intervene come in. It's a, it's a more complicated thing because it involves Teller pushing the atomic or the hydrogen bomb and Oppenheimer was not the director at that point. Norris Bradbury was the director. And a lot of jockeying around with the Air Force and who was going to build this bomb, uh, fueled partly by the fear of the Soviet Union and partly by Teller pushing it. In the end, Teller came back to Los Alamos but was not really made completely in charge of the hydrogen bomb development, and a huge grudge grew up with Teller between Teller and Los Alamos. Even though he came back and worked, he worked for Norris, who was really pretty sympathetic to Teller, I think, considering everything. He used to tell me Teller had a difficult childhood, which I think is true, actually. Um, anyway, as these things played out, Teller was the only scientist willing to really testify against Oppenheimer and say on the public record that he felt, he didn't really say he was a security risk, but he inferred that. And that was enough for this uh, committee to pull Oppenheimer's clearance. And I think that this, that event is still resonating through policy and through science in maybe in all countries, certainly in the United States. I think it made scientists pull back from the political arena. It was a, it was a decisive moment. And to, to go back to me as a kid, I, don't, I didn't really understand all the implications, but I knew I had never seen the adults that I knew as upset about something that was happening in Washington. And they played, I don't know if it was live, but the hearing transcripts on this radio station, KRS. So you could hear what everybody was saying in this testimony. So it was at Los Alamos, the Oppenheimer trials were a huge event that even percolating down to say a 13 year old you know, you got it in the air. Something had really gone off the tracks here. And these guys were, and then later, I mean, a little other part of this, when I was maybe 18 or 19, then Oppenheimer would come in the summer 
but he couldn't go behind the fence because he didn't have a clearance. So the Bradburys, my soon-to-be in-laws, would have parties, and Abby would be there, and all the scientists, and then, you know, the wives and stray kids or something. And at one of these parties, I was passing some sort of hors d'oeuvre. These parties seemed to me they went on a long time. I mean, they weren't really parties. They were, the men would go down to the barbecue and talk about physics, and the women would sit around, and we all lived close together, maybe go home and come back. And, and, and I wonder if the FBI, at that point, to drop back as a footnote, Oppenheimer would not let the, or Groves wouldn't let the, the FBI in Los Alamos. But after the war, I don't know if the FBI was watching, I mean, Priscilla McMillan might know this. Anyway, the parties were like a cover. So I was passing these chicken wings or something, and, I, and there was Oppenheimer standing alone. And I had, by accident, seen films of the raw footage of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I was appalled. I was pretty sure that maybe the men didn't know what had happened when they dropped the bomb. So I asked some of them, you know, because they were our neighbors. And some people talked to me, Carson Mark said, well, you should ask Oppie. Oppie would be the person you should ask. What did we think? So here he was. So <laughs> by then I thought about it in my low brain. And he, I walked up to him and said, you know, would you like a chicken wing or whatever? And, and I think you're some sort of a saint. And he looked at me and he said, why, why would you ever say that to me? And I said, well, because you had second thoughts. And he put his hat on and walked out. I really had thought I was talking to a statue. It never occurred to me I would hurt his feelings. And Lars Bradbury came up and said, what did you say to Oppie? What did you say to Oppie? But I think he was in this most secure place where he was most beloved. And this little child of this place wanders by and asks him this question. And I don't know if he, or I don't know. Anyway, it was, I didn't mean to hurt his feelings or, you know, start up something within him, but it obviously did. So how do you interpret his reaction? Well, I think he had, you know, what I at that age had called second thoughts. And maybe he felt he had been powerless to do anything about it. But uh, a lot of people had different, well, it's, a, it's an event that there's going to be a whole spectrum of opinion. But I think that Oppenheimer had felt that he could perhaps control the course of events after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And of course, he hadn't been able to. And that he knew how terrible they were, but he perhaps felt that maybe it has to be that terrible so everyone will, you know, it's like intervention. You have to hit bottom before you can come up. I don't know, but he obviously had thought about this a lot. And I was, I, I think, I think he, he had just been, he was so adored at Los Alamos that to have this little wafty kid wander by was really an arrow to his heart. And it didn't intend it, but I was just worried that maybe they didn't understand what had happened when they dropped the bombs. It, you also, I mean, of the many levels of this, would you, they hired a high school kid to run the projector to show these films of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, you know, in the now world of hypersecurity, would you hire a 14-year-old guy who was in the radio club to run the films on? But they did. And he was some guy I sort of had a crush on, so I went to see him in the projection booth, and he was just standing there like that, and we watched all these films that have now 
been sanitized and edited and but they weren't then so I don't know so after that do you you must assume then that Oppenheimer was fully aware maybe of seeing these films and I guess he had seen I don't know if he ever saw the films you know they sent people in right after the explosions and these were just like shots panning around I don't know I'm, I don't know whether he saw them or not but I mean as a footnote to that Stalin of course sent an observer in too and, and as we know now the Soviets were well on their way with their own bomb but apparently Stalin after he saw photographs I don't know it was footage live footage he said oh I want one of those I want it in five years and uh, maybe to Kurchatov he said and if I don't get it I will kill you all this is a motivating factor <laughs> but yeah it's very shy but you know Dresden is shocking war is shocking is it more shocking uh, it might be said to be more shocking because of the radioactivity which I don't think was very well understood at all at the time they knew about it but I don't in the estimates that they had projected as the casualties of these two bombs they never included the radiation deaths from radiation because they didn't know enough so and you know the the tolls are sort of squishy in a way because they effects of radiation killed more people later so. right to go back to the party then um, <laughs> what um, how the party were people that had committed to working at Los Alamos you know presumably bigger and better bombs they're working on the hydrogen bombs so how did they um, how did they rationalize that or I don't I don't know I um, I really don't know I mean they because it was all secret I know they they did it uh, but I, I don't know I mean I'm, those are political decisions don't you they they are decisions that came out of Washington almost in like orders and in those days science could do anything you know you had penicillin and you had you know technological miracles really and I think they felt that these scientists could do anything hydrogen bomb and the I mean the early hydrogen bomb tests are way out of control tests and you could get somebody to talk about Mike Ivey and those tests where they just got the calculations wrong and the bombs were much larger than than they had thought um, but that might have been the result of this push for speed because they felt the Soviets were close on our heels and uh, we had you know really at what point does it end say the Cuban Missile Crisis just this enormous buildup of nuclear weapons on both sides with Johnny von Neumann talking about mad but is there during that period of time and this is after the Oppenheimer you know they tear him up uh, is there any governing intelligence on what's really going on does anyone really understand that we do one you do one we do one you do one and, you know and we get these enormous stockpiles of weapons that we've subsequently been taking down but that it's a it's a really although very peaceful and very prosperous time within the United States the nuclear buildup is way out of control and no one seems to have had a real handle on it so it's uh, did Los Alamos did anyone could anyone have stopped it you take both sides to stop it we weren't talking to the Soviets and don't until really the Cuban Missile Crisis when finally Kennedy and Khrushchev realized that we're just about to blow each other up and we have to have a means of communication to say even the Dr. Strangelove thing hello you know Nikita or whatever he says Dimitri <laughs> don't yell at me <laughs> yeah. 
that we were just heading for real trouble was the attitude at Los Alamos, we just do what we were told. Well, that's way too simplistic. I don't think that's really what it was. Could they have stopped it? Could they have refused? And it's my father-in-law, Norris Bradbury, who's building those bombs, who's a very thoughtful, cultured man. Um, and I used to talk to him about all of this because I was always, as a, you know, even from a little kid, even after I gave up espionage, I was really concerned about what was going on. Well, they didn't, they certainly didn't have a deep understanding of it, but um, I didn't think bombs were a very good answer, but it seemed to be the only answer that anybody had come up with. So it's a, it's a tangle. Well, I can just jump back really when we were still living in Bandelier. Um, and I guess this was after I couldn't get in to have my thumb fixed. I asked Daddy what they were doing, and he said, well, we're building a bomb. I thought, oh dear, this isn't for you. You told me you were doing something brand new, and it's a bomb. They've already been invented. I didn't think that was going to work. I was worried about them. So I thought I would invent something myself, a better weapon. And I was going to make a lizard run into the campfire and turn into a dinosaur. And I spent a lot of time trying to herd lizards with a stick into the campfire. And finally, one day, I did get a lizard to run into the fire. And I was terrified it would work, it would turn it, and I realized it was going to eat my family first. That would be, I had made a good weapon, but it was already out of control. And I ran out to get the ranger, this poor ranger, and I made, I wanted to run back because I was sure this dinosaur I had made would eat my family. And I ran back and this guy followed me and there was no lizard and everybody was fine. And I thought, you know, weapons control. It's really very dangerous. You got to be careful if you're going to build something. What happens when it works, you know? And that, I think, was a situation um, perhaps that we're still in. So. I've always been worried about it. <laughs> so in terms of the conversations, I mean, one of the things that is implied in, 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 in what you've just described uh, as the way Los Alamosans thought about these things is that as scientists, they were, um, they felt they did their assignment. They were, you know, doing what they do best um, per instructions from Washington, but beyond that, you know, did they talk about the political uh, ramifications or about the threat of um, Armageddon or was there, were there undercurrents of this not, kind of? Not that I, but as a kid you wouldn't hear that anyway. I don't know. Not among I mean, other, other children? Did other children? Talk about, you know, the duck and cover exercises, is there? Well, we made hideouts in case, you know, something happened, we were going to run down the canyon and live in this little cave we had found. Uh, but it didn't seem very, I don't think it haunted, maybe it did, haunted people. Duck and cover, I think, was a little while, maybe they did at Los Alamos, but it was, for those guys, clearly ridiculous. and that. I mean, if, if that was designed to make people feel better, the people at Los Alamos knew way too much to think that was going to make any difference to you. So I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think really by and large that the closed, cloistered atmosphere of the lab at that time was you just didn't talk outside the lab. There, I mean, there just wasn't, you didn't know what anybody's father did, and you knew you, well, it never occurred to us to ask. Um, I don't, I don't know. Oh, the high school class was, was very, very mixed, and we had, I, you know, just mixed with no, Marianne Naranjo and Anna Mae Naranjo were some of my best friends, and they were much better at algebra than I was, and it was, uh, didn't seem like a huge big deal. 
And I think in retrospect, this was because you didn't know what anybody's father was doing. You know, in, in general, you get your status in high school or grade school from your father, but we had no idea what anybody's father was doing. So it was all kind of, I mean, we might have lived in a slightly nicer house, but uh, class presidents, cheerleaders, you know, it was all very mixed up and seemed, didn't seem like a really big deal to me, um, or maybe to anybody. And, and another part of that was, of course, now I realize there were a lot of Jewish people who had, the European Jewish community who were there, I had no idea what Jewish people were at all. It was just like, I wouldn't say it was a utopian situation, but I think because of the secrecy, which had many bad effects, but because you didn't know what anybody was doing, you were all sort of in the same soup, and um, those differences probably by the end of high school might have become more marked, but not, a, I don't think, not a lot. And what the Los Alamos school system, which was very good, did for the Hispanic kids was give them a terrific high school education. And many of them, like Demas Chavisau, were able to go on to college out of situations that had they stayed in a rural community, they never would have had the opportunities that I think Los Alamos as an economic force in northern New Mexico has really changed northern New Mexico. And the Indian kids did not go to, they could have, but they didn't go to school at Los Alamos, although the lab ran shuttles down to the Pueblos and brought workers up because they didn't have cars every day. And it used to be that the whole lab would close on January 23rd, Samuel Defonso Day, because he couldn't get enough maintenance workers to run the lab. And it was a curious sort of mix. So you had Hispanic kids, and they lived, you know, we all had houses and lived up there. The Indians lived in the Pueblos but came up to work. So there was a division between the Indians who didn't want to live up there and the Hispanic people who were getting nicer houses and good schools. and um, But it was just everybody was in there together. So was there um, segregation among neighborhoods, or, or people were all integrated? How did that work? It was pretty integrated. I think that they say that the housing, once I got the western area, was allocated according to need or size of family. But at one point during one of the fires, some New York Times reporter who must have been going crazy figured out that if you looked at the western area, the streets from 41st to say 48th pretty much represented the rungs of the ladder in the lab. I didn't ever think that at the time, but when I read it I thought, oh yeah, they're right, you know. But it wasn't so stated at all. I don't, and no, I don't think, I mean there was, you know, before you could own your house, you paid some rent that was some ridiculously low thing. So there began, as there was more housing, the economics of the housing began to make some difference, but not, I don't know, not, I don't think a huge, not like, you know, cities where you have real segregated situations, no. So what happened to everyone after the war? You said some scientists left. How many scientists left, do you think? Or? And some came back. I, I think that, well, when Oppenheimer left, I think in September of 45, that the quite naive assumption was that the job was done, the war was won, everybody could go back to academia. And, and many did, and I think well, I've heard people say this, that they got back and it was not as exciting as Los Alamos had been. That Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project years, I mean, I've talked to some of the men who were there and one of them said to me, I was smarter then than I'll ever be again. He said it was just an electric atmosphere. We just worked all the time 
and anything we wanted they tried to get us and we were young and we had parties and it was you know exciting and fun and all these and uh, that academia was paled perhaps by comparison to this you know they all adored Oppenheimer and well, I can tell you this other sort of funny story that is I think of how they worked uh, McAllister Hall who I is a wonderful physicist he told me this story too he worked in a building next to my father and they didn't know each other but because everything you know was in a little compartment but he was pouring um, what daddy did too the shaped explosive lenses for the implosion detonator and they would pour these layers of explosives and then they had to cool and while they were waiting for them to cool they would play baseball and they had it, this is inside a site which was where they worked with conventional explosives so they had this kind of ongoing baseball game while things you were waiting for something and that you didn't want to go home or Max said sometimes you just lay down on the floor and go to sleep because you knew you were going to have to wake up in two hours and anyway well there's well, actually I could talk about that for a minute but uh, so they have this baseball game and at one point one team uh, brought in an outside guy who could really pitch and he throws two or three balls and they go wait wait stop the game you the pitcher you do you know what the periodic table is <laughs> they had brought in a ringer who could pitch <laughs> but that they had uh, the SI cafeteria which we used to think was like Sardis or you know they oh boy the SI cafeteria but they would serve meals almost 24 hours a day because these guys were working like that and they would have these intervals while things cooled and they'd go over to the SI cafeteria and boy as kids if we got to eat at the SI cafeteria like, that was really that was the best place and everybody thought the SI cafeteria was the best cafeteria but they had it turns out now fried chicken and hamburgers I mean it wasn't wasn't like Sardi's uh, but it it was really good food and uh, in inside S site where they're working with conventional explosives when well gosh Cindy you remember when they started taking down all those buildings that were the buildings that housed the different labs for pouring these explosions or the lenses uh, before the big fire at Los Alamos we went in to try to save the last building V site which we did thank you and you looked at the equipment they were using which had all been just sitting there and they had these big graphs that they used to tell what the temperature was on the explosives they would say cool not so cool temperate warmer they didn't have any numbers at all they just had these descriptions and they had this little slot that would say man in charge and then that you could put your name in and out so you'd know who was in charge and you know they were doing all this with slide rules and in their heads there was no the equipment they cooked the explosives in these hard candy cookers they were big that they ordered from some place in Ohio that they used to make peppermint or something that's how they cooked the explosives and that they didn't have more accidents than they did because my father said they they would blow things up all the time and that they never got a ditch they they would just ignite something and run as far as they could and then throw themselves down on the ground and people would say you know we ought to dig a little trench we could jump in the trench that would be better but they never got around to doing it so they and daddy said well you know if you landed on Iwo Jima or Okinawa you didn't have a trench to jump in they're taking many more risks than we are uh, but there are all sorts of stories about S site that they were moving explosives over these terrible dirt roads. And at one point, General Groves came to see.
something or the other at S-Site, and they took the springs out of his Jeep, and then and the general was rotund, and that he pounded his way on this road on a Jeep with no springs, and then after that he paved the road, and they said, it's not a good road to move the high explosives. And they would test at 10 and 12 and 3, so you'd know it was a test, it wasn't an accident. And any time there was an explosion out of that sequence, you could see everybody in town go, mm -hmm. it's not good. But you never knew. But, and then they would, there would be several tests, you know, they go boom, 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 boom. Oh, God, that was a good one. We like big ones. That knocked the plates off the wall or the pictures would rattle or something else. We thought we were real connoisseurs of big explosions, we, little explosions, we, nothing. But they... They had always kept those conventional explosives separate from... So, the result was, of course, that during the war, until maybe 50s, they had the plutonium and they... If, well, they didn't have very much plutonium during, you know, before the war, they, but that was all downtown, what is now downtown. But, because you weren't sure it would work, but the conventional explosives were at S site and both the V site, which is where we can go now on rare occasions uh, to see where they put together the, make sure that the component parts would fit inside the casing and, uh, and the gun site, which is for the, the uranium bomb, will someday perhaps be open to the public they're, they need, I think, a lot of story because when you get to those places, you can't, it's not like the story becomes evident. You have to know what it is that they were trying to do. And, um, but it's great that they have both been saved because I think really the bone simple garage bomb aspect of that work comes through in those facilities that there's nothing fancy, there's nothing. It's just using available materials and, and tape. My father was particularly interested in tape because, you know, they taped all those fuses on for the Trinity test. They didn't want to solder on the live explosives. So we always had things, we were always testing tape at home, pieces of tape hung here and there because they were things that we were testing. And 3M, he worked with 3M, working on the tape, so they, and when you look at the gadget, you see all this tape all over it, and all those fuses are taped, taped on, so. Now, s -side is really pretty interesting, I think, but it's, except for v -side, the baseball diamond is gone. Um, even the, there, I think there are very few buildings, the gun site is there. Oh, and the concrete bowl. Should we talk about the concrete bowl? Um, oh, you can get somebody else to talk about the concrete bowl. <laughs> well, to describe its function. It um, was to save the plutonium, because they had such a small amount of plutonium that if the test didn't work, they wanted to recapture the plutonium. It would roll toward the center of this, which about talk about naive, about what was going to happen. It was, I think, to, to everybody that the fact that these young guys, average age 24 to 26, in 26 months put together two different type of bombs and they both worked, uh, it's an organizational miracle really that they could get different nationalities, different people in a remote location where supplies were always erratic, they could do this. And uh, I think even Teller, everyone says this was Oppenheimer who was the, the leader, the catalyst, the inspiration, who rose above what anyone had ever thought he could do and, and that everyone who worked there thought that it was in large part due to Oppenheimer that they were able to work together and get this done. Um, to what extent were women, did women feel part of this whole gambit or did they feel somewhat isolated or how, how did this experience uh, affect women? I think 
uh, one of the original plans was, of course, that the women would be secretaries. A lot of them worked on those merchant adding machines because it was before they have a computer. They just sat and punched numbers in because they were doing so many calculations. So they also thought when women who had some degrees would work, but I don't. I think that by and large it was the tenor of the time that the men were going to do the important big work and that the women by and large had very young children <laughs> and stayed home. We had maids too. We had maids from Zia Company who came and helped clean and take care of the kids. But I, I don't know, I think that not just in Los Alamos, but everywhere in the 40s, there was a lot more drinking and smoking than now we ever have. But I think that it was it was a difficult environment. It was uh, Francoise Ulam said it was like a camp. You you had to wear a plaid shirt sheet. Francoise, of course, is Polish, French, and very fashionable. <laughs> everyone's wearing blue jeans. Everyone's wearing plaid shirts. It's it's like that takes up a lot of women's time if you're going to live that kind of, even though you might have a maid, you can get a maid who's never seen running water and you know she's going to be good with the kids but she, maybe she can iron, well can she work the washing machine? Um, there were a lot of cultural levels that I think occupied women more than men, that they were sort of sucked into trying to get the understructure going so that men could come home and have one of the things Oppenheimer said was that he wanted the scientists to be happy and they should have their families but God the population under five of Los Alamos by 1945 I don't know what it was but it was very large because everybody had had a baby so there were the laundry the, the stress on the laundry was extreme <laughs> T tell us, where did they uh, recruit the maids? You talk about From that. San Ildefonso, Santa Clara, from San Juan, the nearby Pueblos. And they would bring them up and uh, they would, but, but the thing was, and they spoke Tewa. I thought we should all learn Tewa because everybody I thought spoke Tewa. My mother kept saying, well, Spanish, but actually it was Tewa that seemed like that was the language we heard. Anyway, they, uh, I think that for everybody, it was what you might call another goddamn learning experience because they brought up these maids to help, but often the maids didn't know, they'd never been in houses like that. And uh, so, you know, they, they, did, they did help, but uh, it was, I wonder what they thought when they went home. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it would seem to me that everybody also helped their maids. They would be very worried that the maids would have babies at home and and everybody bought pottery. That was how you helped your maid. Uh, most of the maids were potters and we all bought pottery, a lot of pottery. And that helped them. I think, I think it did, yeah. And uh, <coughs> they we went to Indian dances, and the Indians came up to Los Alamos, and then the scientists taught them to square dance, and then the Indians would teach us how to dance like Indians. It seemed, there are pictures of this, you know, of trying to teach the Indians how to square dance. <laughs> but it was, um, you know, that, I think the Indians were so exotic, really, that, you know, when you say class came in, the Indians were in some other world. They, they, they um, had a whole different set of life and cultural traditions, and and you would sort of pick a pueblo and support that pueblo, and and your maid. So it was, but they didn't for a long time didn't have cars, and so they would just run these little pickup trucks with a little house on the back, and the Indians would crawl in and drive up to Los Alamos. But they got paid. So they put these people on a cash economy, which was for those pueblos at that time. I guess 
I've read that someone said, oh, well, you know, you destroyed their culture. And I don't really think that's true. I think that the people at Los Alamos appreciated in that culture that it was so different. And um, the fact that and then they said, well, they bought all the pottery. They could produce pottery faster than we could buy it. I don't think they. And it made Maria famous. Maria's price is the great potter for San Ildefonso. Everybody, all the prices of the pottery went. And if you look at what people are giving their children and grandchildren now, it's a lot of pottery. We all had a lot of pottery. So that was, it seemed natural, it was interesting. <laughs>